please join me in welcoming Eleanor. Thank you very much, Dana, for that very gracious welcome. Um, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here today. I've spent the afternoon in part sort of traveling all over this part of Vermont in and out of small towns between here in Burlington and down to your river and admired what seems to be a pretty uh, amazing cascade at this point. I don't know whether the river's always that high, but um, anyway, I've enjoyed myself. Um, what I want to talk to you about tonight actually does dovetail with the exhibition that I'm starting to work on on Alexander von Humboldt. And it's totally okay if you've never heard of him. We'll fix that. Um, if you're interested in him, there's a really good biography that I will recommend to you that does not run you through everything he ate for breakfast, which is my least favorite form of biography, but actually makes you care about this man. Um, and by the end of it, I think what you're going to realize is you've always known who Humboldt was. You just weren't quite sure how to connect the dots between all of that. The same thing is kind of going to happen with this talk tonight, because we're used to understanding that landscape is a significant part of our cultural identity. We think about the Park Service. You think about all of the state and national parks that you have up here. Um, and it's not really a new news. But one of the things that I've been really curious about was what does it mean to designate a feature in the landscape as a cultural emblem, something that is part of your identity, something that makes you feel like you belong to a place, and that it in some way it tells other people something about you. Um, this actually really starts right after we win our independence from Great Britain, because we're faced at that point with the fact that we have no built history. Um, we are not plugged into Native American history. We do not have centuries old churches, schools, and cathedrals, um, but we do have a gigantic chip on our shoulder about this. And in part that's because a lot of European scientists and thinkers began to promulgate the idea that in the Americas, North and South, that in essence there were no monuments, there were no advanced civilizations, um, the Comte de Buffon went so far as to say that every life form in the New World was somehow a weaker, lesser, or degenerate version of its counterpart in Europe. The Abbe Reynal and Cornelius de Poe went so far as to say that robust Europeans who arrived on the miasmic shores of the United States soon basically became weak, puny, um, and died. Um, <laughs> Needless to say, this irritated an awful lot of people over here, um, starting with people like Benjamin Franklin, who is our ambassador to Paris, um, and George Washington, who stood well over six feet tall. But it was in the 1780s in Paris that Thomas Jefferson put pen to paper to give the lie to all of this when he wrote his notes on the state of Virginia, which was in answer to a 26-question questionnaire circulated by the French to try to find out whether or not there was anything of real merit here on our shores. That questionnaire was disseminated to all of the representatives at the Continental Congress, most of whom punted on answering it. And the Virginia delegation took one look at Jefferson and went, oh good, you get to do this. <laughs> so they figured that if he managed uh, the declaration, he could probably manage answering the questionnaire. What he wrote was designed to take apart point by point all of the criticisms about the new world. And in order to impress upon people the idea that we were in fact somehow as good as everybody else, he picked two features that he thought would set us apart. The first was Natural Bridge, which you see on the left hand side, a piece of property that was surveyed by George Washington as a young man for Lord Rockbridge. Um, and in fact, there's a, there's a story that uh, Washington actually scrambled up the side and left his initials 26 feet up the left hand side, which is why the people down here at the bottom are pointing up in that direction in case you were going to miss the double significance of this. And then Jefferson buys the property. He has a free man of color whose name is Patrick Henry, not that Patrick Henry, but another Patrick Henry, who acts as an absentee landlord and built in tour guide who is in fact in that picture pointing up at the initials. And this is considered one of the most magisterial pieces of property on the eastern seaboard. Keep in mind we are just 13 colonies at this point, now 13 states. The second thing 
which won't be excavated until 1801, is the mastodon. We have found mastodon bones. We don't know it's a mastodon. We're calling it a mammoth because let's face it, we are talking about scale and we are talking about a metaphor. And the mammoth that you see there is 11 feet tall, 16 feet long, and stood in Charles Wilson Peale's museum in Philadelphia. Those two were the symbols that Jefferson pointed to in his notes on the state of Virginia when he referred to Natural Bridge as the eighth wonder of the world and the Mastodon as the ninth wonder of the world. No, we don't have a chip on our shoulder now, do we? Um, but the point is, what he was able to do was to point to a natural bridge that was more impressive than a lot of man-made bridges and a Mastodon that turned out to be the largest terrestrial life form since we have not yet found dinosaurs. Don't get me started on that, okay? We have not found dinosaurs yet, so Miocene fossils are the biggest things from the Ice Age. We don't know that it's an Ice Age yet either. That, that happens 40 years later. So Jefferson has written his notes on the state of Virginia. Um, Buffon, in fact, has a copy and has read it, but being French, he's slightly dismissive of the whole thing, and having never visited the New World, he is convinced we are lying. Um, but in 1804, we had an unexpected visitor to these shores, one German naturalist named Alexander von Humboldt, whom you see here on the left-hand screen, um, at roughly the age that he arrived in the United States, and Thomas Jefferson, who was then president of the United States, um, roughly at the age at which he met Humboldt. So it's kind of nice to be able to get a sense of what the two men were like. Humboldt had just finished five years traveling across New Spain throughout northern uh, South America, a year in Mexico, and he was in Cuba. He had 4,000 pages of notes. He had 6,000 botanical specimens that were new to science. He had already shipped home the rocks because they're kind of heavy. He had found mammoth bones in the Andean highlands. He had pumped the indigenous people for information and had come away convinced that the Aztec, the Olmec, the Maya, and the Inca were not rude, crude, backward civilizations, but in fact had once been grand civilizations that had been ground down through war and disease and colonization into just shadows of themselves. Um, he is beginning to develop his theory of the unity of nature, something we take for granted today, that everything is interconnected, that there are ecosystems, that there are downstream consequences to deforestation or other choices that we make about the way we use the land. And when he goes back to Paris, he will promulgate these ideas and become the single most influential, best known public intellectual of the early 19th century, much to Napoleon's dismay, dislike, and disgust. He had a hard time actually putting up with anybody who looked like he might actually attract more attention. Um, so Humboldt is in Cuba, and he's waiting for the first uh, Spanish frigate that will take him back home. There's a blockade. The Treaty of Amiens has, has blown apart. The British, the French, and the Spanish are blockading each other's ships. It's kind of dicey trying to get home. And the assistant consul in um, Cuba, Vincent Gray, um, starts chatting up Humboldt, who's a talkative kind of guy. And Humboldt, who has been in the wilderness for five years, now has an audience. And he starts popping stories right and left. And what he does is he tells, Jefferson, he tells Gray that he has a map that he has made of the interior of the North American continent based on a year's worth of research in Mexico. Well, may I remind you that in 1804, we had just acquired the Louisiana Purchase. The Kingdom of Spain is not happy about this. Napoleon ditched the territory because he needed to pay off his war debts. The Spanish are furious, like, are you crazy? You gave it to them instead of to us? And we're like, yes. <coughs> Because what Jefferson wants to do is literally have the country stretch from one side to the other to minimize the number of foreign boundaries, to get rid of the international fur trade and make it all part of the United States up the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. And so what you see here are all of the mines, all of the churches, all of the infrastructure down into Mexico, up along the Louisiana coast, into Texas, into the southwest. That's Baja, California. We've got the rivers going almost all the way up to the Canadian border. This is blank on most maps. 
Jefferson is trying to negotiate a border with Spain and he has no idea what he's doing. And to give you an idea of what he doesn't know about, Spain is saying, well, let's take the Sabine River up here in, on modern day Louisiana and make that the boundary between all of us. And Humboldt's like, no, 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 you want the Rio Grande, which is of course what we have today. Well, Jefferson starts asking him, well, what's in between those places? What am I actually getting? Do people live there? Are there? Is there infrastructure? Is it worth actually having the land? And what Humboldt does is he brings with him to the United States a geopolitical gold mine that he is willing to share, even though he has just conducted all of this research ostensibly for the Spanish crown. Humboldt is one of those people who believes that knowledge belongs to everybody. Um, yeah, you may want to publish it first and put your name on it, but the point is not to hide it, the point is to share it. So Vincent Gray convinces Humboldt, you're this close. You've read Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. You want to meet this man. You think American democracy just might be the ideal political system. Why would you leave now? And so he convinces him to make a six-week detour. He comes up into Philadelphia. He is feted by the American Philosophical Society, of which Jefferson is still the president. Um, he is taken around. They have dinner underneath that mastodon that I showed you, that very mastodon in Philadelphia. Um, and then they come down to Washington, D.C., where Humboldt will spend his time with Jefferson, with Secretary of State James Madison, with Albert Gallatin, who's the Secretary of the Treasury, um, and they will just have a blast. Um, what happens at that point is that Jefferson will also tell him as much as he can about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Humboldt missed Lewis and Clark by six weeks. He's a little bit frustrated by that because he's like, did they take the right instruments? Do they know what they're doing? I need to go with them. I need to retrace their steps. When can I start? And of course, we're excited to have him do this. This is one of the leading scientists of his generation who has just landed on our shores. Well, of course, Jefferson can only answer the Lewis and Clark questions to the extent that his directions to Lewis and Clark made any sense. But what Humboldt does is changes the stakes. You know, what Jefferson wants is peace treaties with the Indians, peel them away from the British and the French, take over the fur trade, find a navigable route to the Pacific coast, and basically come back with as much scientific information and decent maps as possible. What Humboldt wants to do is longitude, latitude, atmospheric pressure, barometric pressure, <laughs> seismic activity. What kind of soil is there? What kind of plants grow in there? Do they correlate with what's going on in South America? Does that correlate with Africa? Does it correlate with Europe? Because all of this fits into his unity of nature. And Jefferson's like, damn, we didn't ask that. <laughs> so we are now really excited about the idea because what Humboldt says to us that makes a difference, that kind of resounds through all of this is, he sort of points vaguely to the Blue Ridge Mountains and says, everything west of these mountains is new to science. He can't wait. When he gets back, he writes to his brother and goes, when, when do I get to go back? He is really excited about this because this is a new world to conquer. And he is convinced that what we will find there will be the kind of thing that puts us on the map scientifically, culturally, and historically. And what we find there, of course, there's the Mastodon. Stuck him in there after all is Natural Bridge. And on top of Natural Bridge, we will find Niagara Falls. And then as we go west, we're going to find the places that we've now enshrined in national parks, none of which we really know about at this point. So while we are busy thinking about how to end up crafting a kind of identity around landscape, Humboldt goes back to Europe and begins to incorporate us into his writings. Now, I love the exuberant typography on this particular page of the translation. It's researches concerning the institutions and monuments of the ancient inhabitants of America with descriptions and views of some of the most striking scenes in the Coraleras, exclamation point, written in French by Alexander de Humboldt and translated into English by Helen Maria Williams. So what you have is all of Humboldt's exuberant personality coming through first in the typography of the frontispiece and in the smoking South American volcano of Cotopaxi, and then on every single page of this travelogue. We've never seen travel writing like this. Humboldt is literally jumping up and down in his shoes, in his prose, which being German means they're paragraph-long sentences that don't make nice, pithy quotes and sound bites, but that actually do exhaust you while you're trying to read them. But 
What he's also doing is explaining to you that art and science are combined. That if you're a scientist out in the field, you should marvel at how blue the sky is. And if you're an artist, you need to know what kind of rock you are painting. And so the goal is to bring the two sides together in order to create what he calls a natur gamalda, a picture of nature. So this particular book turns out to be pretty important for us because one of the things that he does on page 53 is compare a natural bridge in Venezuela called the Bridge of the Iconanzo with Jefferson's natural bridge in Rockbridge County, Virginia. He calls out Jefferson by name. Hi, Tom. It's like owned by that savant, the president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. They're in print in both French and English. He is extolling us. He is basically giving us a giant bear hug and welcoming us into his orbit. You can just imagine that the Comte de Buffon and Reynal and de Poe are necessarily none too pleased about all of this because Humboldt is essentially starting to dance circles around all of them. He basically won't stop running circles around them, but that's kind of the fun part. In the United States, we begin reading Humboldt in the 18-teens and the 1820s as those first English translations begin to show up on our shores. They're reviewed in the newspapers and in the journals. Um, they're extolled by all of the leading intellectuals that we have at that point. Um, and among the people who become most fascinated are Cyrus West Field up in the upper left from Stockbridge. Um, who will end up um, developing the transatlantic cable, which is why his hand is on a globe. And the artist Frederick Church, uh, down below him, whom you all know from, I hope, any number of works of art uh, that were done up in New England as well as other places. Well, they start reading Humboldt's views of the Cordilleras, and they start designing a seven and a half month long trip to South America to retrace Humboldt's steps using this as their guidebook. They will literally debark at the same place, come up the same rivers, go over the same passes, experience some of the same weather, climb some of the same volcanoes, um, and get spit out the other side. Uh, they won't stay down there as long as Humboldt did, but it's a good long trek, and it will change Church's life, um, not just in terms of adopting South American imagery, but much more profoundly than that. So what happens also is they decide they need a test run in order to figure out whether or not they're decent traveling companions. If you're going to spend seven and a half months in a country where you don't speak the language, you probably want to get along pretty well with each other. So where do they go on that first test drive? Natural bridge. Of course. Why wouldn't you go to Virginia? It's a lot closer. And you just flip the paradigm. And so this is the painting that Frederick Church paints as a result of that first trip down to Natural Bridge. Now, Cyrus Field is scientifically minded too, and he notices these gorgeous colors on the Triassic <laughs> formations here along there, and he notices the church is just sketching in pencil and putting notes in the edges. Very evocative color notes, but it's like color by numbers. Um, he literally, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and he's like got the different colors on there, and Field's like, D -d -d don't you want rocks? You know, we can take rocks back. He said, I don't need the rocks. And, he goes, and so Field pockets the rocks because he's really worried about this. And when they get home, Church paints the picture and Field is like, I, ha I have rocks. <laughs> and Church is like, I don't need the rocks. So there's this fabulous moment where Church unveils the painting and Cyrus Field pulls out the rocks and the colors match. Oh. <laughs> and what happens is Church is assailed as having the best color memory of any artist known to man. Cyrus Field is thrilled because he's found the perfect <coughs> artist to take with him to South America and for that matter any place else. <laughs> he will become one of Church's most loyal and consistent and generous patrons. He will pay for that trip to South America, which is not bad. Um, and so what we have now is the ultimate sort of buddy movie um, with Cyrus Field and Frederick Church deciding to take off um, into the wilds of South America. Well, they actually go to the natural bridge of the Iconanzo, and then they go to Tecandama Falls. And that is Humboldt's engraving on the left-hand side of the falls of Tecandama. That is Church's painting that he will make once he gets back home. Um, it is gigantic. Um, and it is really intended, in this sense, to be able to 
uh, both flatter what Humboldt has done, but also expand on that. And of course, you can see that they've chosen different vantage points. Church actually sketches it from this vantage point as well. It's like he's circling around. And there's a wonderful day where Humboldt wrote um, in, uh, in 1802 that he had had a couple of the local Indios you know, chop away with machetes so that he could actually get up close to the falls from down below because it was deeply overgrown. Here is Church going 50 years later who hires six local Indios to hack away at the ground where, so that he can actually have the same experience. What they're doing is they're reading Humboldt by firelight and then they are enacting his itinerary the next day. It is the ultimate Humboldt reunion tour. And so they are going to go all the way across um, northern South America to do this. Now Humboldt also nearly bankrupts, and well he does bankrupt himself actually at least once, um, by supervising and printing gigantic atlases with full color um, illustrations. This is a 24 by 36 inch spread um, when the book is open. It's the geographical atlas that goes along with that little guidebook that Church had in his pocket the entire time down there. And this is the Plains of Tapia with um, Chimborazo um, in the back. Now Chimborazo, before we understood that the Himalayas were actually higher than the Andes, this was considered the highest mountain in the world. Um, its summit is roughly at, where they thought it was somewhere between 20 and 21,000 feet. Um, there was a French climber who had climbed it as high as any human being had gotten. Um, Humboldt is exhilarated that he nearly kills himself actually getting higher than that. He makes it to 19,600 feet in 18th century clothes, no Gore-Tex, no Vibram soles, no supplemental oxygen. Um, his gums are bleeding, his eyes are bleeding, he's losing instruments right and left, and he is as happy as he will ever be in his life. Church doesn't do that because he's not that kind of guy, but he is channeling all of that. And he realizes that Chimborazo is, going, is, is basically Humboldt's mountain at that point, because that's a climbing record that will last 30 years. It will take that long for someone else to make it past the crevasse that stopped them. But what the Atlas does is not only inspires Church to understand that's what we're going to see, but it also inspires him in the way that he composes his landscapes. Now this is our painting um, at the Smithsonian. This is, um, this is actually Cotopaxi, not Chimborazo, but I think you can actually see the relationship both between the fact that Church has carefully chosen exactly the same angle so that you can, this is called the head of the Inca. It's a blown out cone on the side of the volcano. Um, he's chosen exactly the same place that you saw in the frontispiece with all of the crazy um, typing on there. Um, and then he has chosen that particular page in order to actually set his both his palette and his composition. So what Church is doing is he's beginning to synthesize Humboldt. He's beginning to not just channel him, but decide how to merge art and science and exploration in order to do something that allows him to create um, original works of art. What's also great, and Cyrus Field will buy this painting when they get back home again, because yeah, you know, let's have a souvenir from all of this. But even better than just a souvenir of didn't we have fun down at Cotopaxi, what's really important about this painting is that's the hacienda Humboldt stayed in when he went through there. There are two travelers and a puppy um, right there. And it's kind of like, is it Church and Field? Is it Humboldt and Bonplan? Do we really know? Do we care? But this is a portrait of Humboldt that was hanging in that hacienda that was made in 1802 when Humboldt got there. So what does Church do? He hires a descendant of the original artist to paint a copy for him, which he rolls up and takes back home as his own souvenir. So I think we've got a fan. Um, and I think Church has found his mentor. And what he adores about Humboldt is that Humboldt isn't picky about his landscapes. He doesn't think there is anything less than or greater than. Europe is not better than the Andes. So America is not less than all of these places. He gives us that sense that the landscape under our feet and in front of us is worth being proud of, which is exactly the ethos that we really need. So I mentioned that when Church comes back home, he paints Tecandama Falls. This is roughly six feet wide and about eight feet tall. Um, so it's 
It's a big one. Um, but what's interesting about it is that although it does exactly what Humboldt would have wanted him to do, you go from the cold zone at the top of the falls, and by the time you come down to the bottom, it's much warmer. And Humboldt talks about how the plants are different at the top and at the bottom. And that you're going from a cold climate to a warm climate. He's beginning to work out biomes. Um, and so church does the same thing, which you can't see in this reproduction, but if you come to my show, you'll be able to see because this painting will be in it, is that there are vines and there are orchids and there are birds and there's all kinds of stuff here that is drawn from both Humboldt's writings and Church's sketches so that it becomes a superabundance of information. There's only one problem. Church kind of had a hard time painting the water down here in the foreground and it kind of looks scallopy and it's, you know, A for effort, but mm, we're not quite sure about the achievement. And he gets reamed out in the press for this. Mr. Church should not paint water because he certainly cannot. <laughs> so what does our boy Fred do? He goes to Niagara Falls <laughs> and he learns to paint water. And you will see in, you know, water coming, cascading over the falls, water sort of dancing along and then turning it into an oil sketch. This is the Niagara River, not really dissimilar from what your river looks like right now, I might add. Um, but as you can imagine, he is trying to stop water in his mind so that he can sketch it, so that when he comes back home, the following year, he's like, oh yeah? Three years difference between Tecumdana Falls and Niagara Falls. I would say that Fred has learned how to paint water. Um, it's not the only thing that he did. This painting is double the width for the height that you would expect a normal landscape painting to be. It's close to 90 inches long. And so most landscape paintings follow the golden section. You'd stop like right about here. Um, and no, Church stretches it because of course this is Niagara. He takes away your foreground so basically, you're either standing in the water about to get sort of hauled over the falls, or you hope you're hovering on a rock and that your balance is really good. And it's intentional. He wants you to feel immersed in this landscape. He wants you to feel the spray of the water. He wants you not to really have a focal point where you can hold on for dear life and believe that things are steady underneath you. And what Church will do from here on out is every single one of his paintings in some way will break the rules, either through scale, through scope, through format, or through content. It's as though he is setting himself an additional challenge every single time. You don't think I can paint water? We'll paint water. So what do you do on top of that? And just to give you an idea, that's the difference in the water in three years where you've got kind of scallop, 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 and you've got water literally dancing over the rocks. You know, nice little rainbow coming off of there, mist rising up through all of this. It's an extraordinary painting. That's in the exhibition too. So you'll be able to actually see that story play out. Um, so right now what we have is Church has just, with Niagara Falls, let me go back with just a second. Um, with Niagara Falls, he has now painted the two leading icons in the United States. How do we know they're the leading icons in the United States, aside from the fact that I'm telling you that? Because in 1825, when Henry S. Tanner builds the newest, best map of what we know about the United States at that point, and about North America all the way up and all the way down, you know, maps have cartouches, um, and the cartouche often tells you something about what the map maker wants you to understand, and what I adore about this cartouche, oh look at this, there's Natural Bridge, oh holy smokes, there's Niagara Falls feeding through Natural Bridge. <laughs> so we've just switched about what, 1500 miles of US territory from upstate New York down into central Virginia, and what we've essentially done is said this is the United States. So. Just to sort of remind you, and actually it's kind of even better too, I mean, there, there's 
a, a beaver, um, there's a moose. There's a great story that before we found the mastodon, Jefferson um, had the largest moose he could find stuffed and mounted and sent to Buffon in France. The problem is it was kind of moth-eaten by the time it got there. So Buffon wasn't all that impressed except by the antlers, which were falling off. Um, so it, it, it didn't work out as well as he thought it was going to. So sending mastodon bones uh, to Georges Cuvier made, made a lot more sense. Um, but in any event, um, it is kind of fun that all of that is in there. Well, don't take my word for the fact that the cartouche matters or that maps carry metaphorical, patriotic, symbolic meaning because my very favorite map is called the Leo Belgicus. It is the map of Belgium artistically turned sort of on its side so that it can be made into a lion. Um, now, this started, the first version of this uh, was made in 1583. This is actually the 1609 truce map at the time of the independence from Spain, which carries the extra resonance of, we kicked them out, the landscape is ours. So what you have is you have Putti dropping goblets in a shower of gold down on the landscape. You've got people in, in great clothes, you've got this wonderful sword. Um, the warrior down here is able to sleep because his job is done and you have portraits of all of the leading port cities and interior cities um, and all of the Canton um, coats of arms up at the top. Mm -hmm. It is an extraordinary patriotic map. I love this map because to me this basically is why we have landscape painting because when the land belongs to you, you can take pride in it. If you're occupied, there's a lot less effort that you put into painting somebody else's landscape. And so this notion that from you know, Henry Tanner's cartouche essentially defining what he finds um, sort of unique and memorable about the United States, particularly in, with reference to the fact that cartographers are always riffing off of each other, um, it just seemed to me to make sense to bring that up to you. So here we have Frederick Church at Niagara Falls, at Natural Bridge, essentially creating an ethos for an American cultural identity. So how do you top this? I mean, what are you gonna do now? Because the critics were all like, well, you know, he's gonna have to top that, otherwise it's gonna just haunt him for the rest of his life. Uh, because critics are like that. And in fact, it does haunt him for the rest of his life, although he, that does not mean that he's not game for actually trying to outdo himself. <laughs> and so for the next one, we're gonna go back to Humboldt again, because what he's gonna do is take a second trip to South America. In fact, right after he debuts Niagara Falls, it's kind of like, see you later, and takes off for South America again. This time, he's going straight to Chimborazo um, because it was kind of socked in the last time he was there, and he wasn't really into climbing in socked in weather conditions. He's headed here, not up to the top, because again, Fred's not a climber. Um, what he's going to do is create a painting that he's going to call The Heart of the Andes. It is a composite. Please don't ask me where you can go to stand and look at this because you can't. Except if you travel far enough, it will all coalesce in your brain, which is exactly what Humboldt would have wanted you to do. So what you need to understand, and we're gonna go through this picture in a bit of detail, is we are going from the Amazon River Basin all the way up to close to 20,000 feet um, and really sort of have it all in focus all at the same time. There is no one central focal point. Your eye is darting all over the place, trying to take it all in, um, which is next to impossible, but that's the point. What's his template? His template is Humboldt's plant geography map. Remember I mentioned a Naturgemalde, a picture of nature, and what Humboldt did when he came back from South America was, he wrote it all up, but Humboldt really didn't like linear narratives because that's just linear. And what he wanted to do was pioneer something that we now have this snazzy term, infographics. But what he really does is it's tables of information correlated with a beautiful illusionistic watercolor. And so what you have here, in German, in this case, there is a French version too, um, you have the heights of all of the major mountains in Europe and in South America. This is Chimborazo, that's Cotopaxi. Um, when Humboldt tries to tell you sort of where the cloud layers are and where the snowpack is and where certain types of species change over, 
um, the way it goes, as you know, from the lowlands all the way to the tops of the mountains. Um, he then switches over to the Latin names of all of the plants that you would expect to find at those altitudes. So that literally, while he is charting um, altitude, barometric pressure, literally he's got a cyanometer which measures the color blue, the intensity of the color blue in the sky, and he's marking that down. Byron makes fun of him in a canto from Don Juan, in case you want to go find that. Um, he's listing all of the characteristic plants. He knows at what altitude you stop seeing butterflies because he's that kind of manic, obsessive observer. And so what happens is church essentially adopts that, and that's what Heart of the Andes is. It is a compendium of every single flowering plant, tree, grass, every rock formation, everything he can think of from his two trips to South America all in one painting. And so what you get is this spectacular, if impossible, blue plant. No one really knows what the blue plant is because there aren't that many blue plants in nature, but it was blue, it, the color hasn't changed. But what you've got is you've got orchids and you've got arums and you've got ferns and you've got these lowland oak trees and you've got the roots hanging over the water. And he's literally just stuffed as much in this as possible. Mark Twain went to go see this picture and wrote to his brother Orion and basically starts out with this, this is the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. And in the set, he said, I went back a second time and I'm just exhausted. And the third time he's like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> And he basically says, you just can't take it in. Your brain just shuts down. But that's the point, because it's like reading Humboldt, where it's like drinking from a fire hose. And after a while, you just have to say, oh, I think I need a break. And so this is the painting that does not give you a break. Um, there are paths in there. There's the path you can bushwhack your way up through the hills. You can take the path past the little shrine and sort of duck off into the hills and presumably you'll end up out here on Milano. Um, and then, if you want to add the top, there is, it's really hard to see in this slide, there's a little tiny rainbow, kind of like, okay, fine, you know, don't forget the rainbow, remember that from Niagara Falls? And so you've got, there's a vulture up there, a little tiny thing, so that the longer you look, people brought their opera glasses. <laughs> they would roll up tubes of paper, which actually works really well too. It, sometimes, you know, sort of unnerves the guards in, in art museums, so be a little careful about how close you get, but it's a very effective tool if you can't get very close. It's surprising how well that works. But what you have is Church's homage to Humboldt. And we know it's an homage because when he finishes the painting and puts it and is about to put it on view in New York, he's making plans to have it crated and shipped to Berlin for Humboldt to see it. And the crate's almost done when the word comes that Humboldt has died. Oh. Now he was almost 90, but still. He'd been live and kicking four months earlier at George Washington's birthday celebration with the Berlin ambassador where he had a garland in his hair and said, I'm half an American. So I mean, it was like, yay. Um, Church is crushed. The New York Times is crushed for him. It's like he never met him, but he's lost his best friend. So I mean, literally we have embraced the idea that Humboldt is the guiding ethos behind our landscape painting tradition. So the painting stays in New York. Um, it then goes on tour, Boston, Cincinnati, all over the place. And what I find interesting about it is, yes, it is bigger than Niagara Falls. But what Church is doing is he's starting to quote from himself. There's the table rock in Niagara. And there's the foreground where the river takes the turn in the foreground of part of the Andes. And what I love about it, it's, it's as though what Church is saying is, just as Humboldt understood that you could find similar plant forms at the same altitude in the Andes and the Rockies and the, the Alps and the Apennines, you find similar formations, you see similar things, your eye is drawn to things that look familiar. And so he's beginning, he will begin to quote himself in his paintings. Um, and then comes the Civil War. Because one of the questions we have to ask is, okay, you know, Heart of the Andes is great. It's an awesome painting. Um, it's a Humboldtian painting. But is it an American painting? Is it something that really sort of screams and bleeds in America? Not until the Civil War. The painting is finished in 1858. Humboldt dies in 1859. 
1861, we plunge into the Civil War. In 1864, there is the Sanitary Fair in New York, um, which features the gigantic park uh, armory with Leutz's Washington crossing the Delaware, ultimate patriotic picture right here, hundreds of paintings all around it. This is the moment where people in New York are like, hey, we did a pretty good job pulling that stuff together. Can we keep it? And that's when they decided to start thinking about founding the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is one of the reasons that painting is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As is, and you can kind of see that this is a stereo view. I'm sorry if I didn't say that before. So it's a double. Um, you would have looked at it and it would have looked like 3D. On the left-hand side is Albert Bierstadt's Rocky Mountain Lander's Peak, which wouldn't sound like it had Civil War resonance except that um, Lander had actually been a leading Civil War general who had just died from injuries sustained in a battle. And so this was Church's, I mean, uh, Bierstadt's memorial picture um, set out in the Western United States, which Bierstadt would kind of kind of say, hey, you've got Niagara Natural Bridge in South America. I've got the West, leave me alone. And in fact, Church will never go west of the Mississippi, um, and Bierstadt will stay clear of most of the places that Church paints, because there's kind of an unofficial deal between the two of them. For our mutual survival, we should just leave each other alone. This is in fact the first time that Church and Bierstadt have paintings in the same gallery at the same time. They have assiduously avoided this. Heart of the Andes is over here. So what makes Heart of the Andes resonant in American art? You stick portraits of the first three presidents over it, is what you do. And so what you have here is Heart of the Andes in a gigantic casement frame, you know, draped in, in velvet drapes. It's literally set up like a window, like you could pop through and just go walking out into the middle of this. And above it, you've got George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. There are the three portraits. Just to give you an idea, there's old TJ in that red fox for a collar again, um, which you'll also see in the exhibition. Um, so the idea here is that what turns a South American painting devoted to Humboldt into an American painting is the context of the Civil War. Um, that exhibition of those paintings in the armory was described by one critic as an exercise in northern patriotism. The ideal was these are mostly northern artists painting mostly northern <coughs> landscapes. So if you're going to have a southern landscape, which at this point the Arctic is sort of associated with the north and the tropics are sort of associated with the south, and that's not really a good thing, so you stick presidents over it and it kind of cancels it out. <laughs> and you think marketing is a new thing. Yeah. So what you have is this is a moment where landscape becomes, in Church's hands, emblematic of that merging of personal, professional, and national statements about purpose, about the scale and scope of your cultural ambitions, the confidence with which you move forward, believing in what you are doing. Um, and it's not just patriotic scenery, it's now that whole ethos behind all of it. Now, each work that Church will do from here on out, as I mentioned, will try to reach higher, better, bigger, more interesting. Um, and so, after the Heart of the Andes in 1859, the first thing that Church will paint is the icebergs. This is 1861. He has the great colossal <coughs> bad fortune to debut this 12 days before Fort Sumter, after Fort Sumter. So it's like, nobody cares. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the news is all about Fort Sumter. Um, when Church painted this, the mast isn't here, so I'm, I'm going to have to kind of ask you to kind of do what you can to understand that when Church first painted this, there is nothing in this image to suggest human scale. I mean, we don't know if that background iceberg is four stories tall, 19,300 feet. I mean, is that Chimborazo in the back basically formed out of ice with that dome there? There were people who thought so. Um, and when Church paints the mast in the foreground, unfortunately, he shrinks the picture because masts are 90 feet tall. That's a crow's nest. That's about a 12-foot spar of the mast. And suddenly, that picture is the size of a bathtub um, instead of basically the size of the heart of the Andes. So you know, poor Fred had kind of a rough time. But 
Um, what he ended up doing was painting the mast in order to turn this into an Arctic rescue picture to send to England so that Sir John Franklin's widow and every surviving polar explorer could raise a glass to it. Um, and it's bought by a patriotic member of parliament and hung in their house, so he wins. Um, again, it's really about marketing. But in order to make it intelligible, Church has to get two of his friends to write broadsides about it so that you have explanations of what it is that you are looking for. After Icebergs with a Painter was written by his best friend, Louis Legrand Noble, who describes what it's like to try to sketch icebergs in a small ship's tender when you are prone to seasickness and you have tried to anchor yourself to an iceberg, which is a colossally bad idea, can I just tell you. Um, they figured that out. They didn't do it a second time. And then there is the North. Mr. Church's picture of icebergs, and it literally goes section by section because there is no mast, and people are like, what is this? What am I supposed to be looking at? But what Church did was decided to paint something that was really a disquisition on water. He had done reading about physics and optics and ice, and what you have is ice and atmosphere and water, and you've got compressed ice in those icebergs, um, so that what he's really trying to do is to paint a picture that is a full-on science lesson in addition to a, a really fabulous um, painting. When he turns to painting Jamaica and paints rainy season in the tropics in 1865 and 66, one rainbow? Let's go for two. Um, and what Church <laughs> understands is the second rainbow is the inverse of the first one. So if you go look at your second rainbow, you will notice the colors go in one order in the outer rainbow. The second rainbow flips it. If there's a third rainbow, it'll flip it back. Um, he actually understands the optics. But what he's also done is kind of gone back, and you'll notice that Jamaica doesn't have a mountain like that in the background. <coughs> We're back in South America. We are back in another sort of composite landscape, and it becomes really an end of the Civil War essay on crossing over from this world into the next world, going from a lush, um, earth-like environment across. There's actually a little white city down here on the, uh, on the shoreline, as though this really is about finding a way to make peace with what we've just been through. And then in 1865, the Aurora Borealis, um, which is also owned by Cyrus Field. Um, at this point, it is not just a picture, again, about Arctic rescue um, or about the auroras, which Church has also been reading about, but this is the year that um, what Church is commemorating is in 1858, Cyrus Field was able to take Samuel F.B. Morse's Morse code and telegraph, and with Matthew Fontaine Morey, run a cable from Newfoundland to Ireland, which is essentially the stretch that you see here, they had a hard time keeping the cable from snapping. I mean, past a certain point, they knew it was just a matter of technology. If we can make the cable strong enough to stretch from one side to the other and not break, we're good to go. The first message is from James Buchanan to Queen Victoria. Frederick Church and Cyrus Field make sure that Alexander von Humboldt has a snippet of that cable on his desk as soon as that first message goes through. But the kind of broken auroras are a little bit like the snapped cables. It's the promise of electromagnetics as a source of communication. What Humboldt always wanted more than anything else was to be able to spread information around the world and communicate with everybody around the world, preferably instantaneously, definitely <laughs> without Napoleon opening up and censoring his mail. Um, and so to him, the telegraph over land and the transatlantic cable on the seabed were the promise of what we now think of with the internet. I mean, I like to think of Humboldt as being a combination of Google and Wikipedia all rolled into one because of his insatiable knowledge, his incessant curiosity, uh, the man did experiments on himself because why wouldn't you? Um, nobody else was volunteering. Um, he's holding electric eels and nearly electrocuting himself in South America. He's just, he is one of those people who it's like, what happens when you do this? Um, it is a marvel the man lived until he was 89 years old, um, given the time period in which he was living. But I honestly think that there was just such effervescence that he just simply was not willing to slow down or stop. 
the legacy that he gave us was at the very beginnings of our nation the courage to believe in ourselves the courage to believe that what we brought to the table in terms of natural features exploration science and a homegrown cultural identity was more important than trying to mimic Europe and I think that for us the entire history of American landscape painting is really grounded if you will in the idea that local scenery is national scenery and that there is a reason that we all care so deeply about it it will not be a big surprise to you to find that when Theodore Roosevelt becomes president and inaugurates the National Park Service he is a man who is a deep believer in Humboldt. In 1903, he is camping with John Muir in the Eastern Sierras uh, in Yosemite, thinking about how to commemorate and set aside these singular landscapes that we have. Um, and Muir will say, oh, how I long to be a Humboldt. And, J and uh, Roosevelt will say, the only unfortunate thing about America's educational system in the early 20th century is that we are no longer training people to think like Humboldt, we are training specialists. Because what Humboldt did was sat at the foundation layer of every single one of the sciences that we think of today. We went from natural philosophy to the natural sciences to essentially the entire course curriculum of a liberal arts college. I imagine we could pick up a course catalog from Middlebury and I can go, yeah, from anthropology to zoology, Humboldt has his fingerprints on all of those things. In 1869, 10 years after he died, Louis Agassiz delivered a memorial address in Boston. Agassiz was a close friend. He had postulated that the earth had undergone an ice age and was nearly laughed out of Germany for such a, a crazy idea, which Humboldt found plausible. And then when John Muir posited the equally laughable but ultimately true idea that Yosemite was carved by glaciers, um, there is this sense of a handoff from one to the other. What Agassiz said was, Every school child in America owes their teaching to Humboldt. They just don't know that he has been their master. The saturation, the level of ubiquity, the level of absorption that we address Humboldt's ideas essentially becomes like breathing um, in the air. And when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, she did not mention Humboldt once, but every single one of her ideas could have easily had him standing next to her, whispering in her ear, saying, absolutely, keep going, you're on the right path. I think today, as we think about climate change, as we think about biodiversity, as we think about our weather systems and the way that we are stewards of the land around us, these are ideas that Humboldt cared deeply about. And I think that he would be pleased to find that people like you come out on a night like this um, to hear a little bit about why I think he still matters. Thank you very much. Do you have time for some questions? I would be more than happy to take any questions you might have. The biography that I was going to recommend to you, Andrea Wolf, W-U-L-F, it's called The Invention of Nature. It's been on the bestseller list for a year and a half now since it came out. Andrea is on the Endless Book Tour. Um, if you ever get the chance to hear her, please don't miss it. She has a lovely British accent and she's exceedingly smart. Um, but The Invention of Nature is the book that I would recommend because it really does make Humboldt come alive. Yes? When Humboldt and these other folks spoke with each other and wrote to each other, Yes. What language did they use? Outstanding question. Um, Humboldt knew about 18 languages by the time he died. <laughs> Are you really surprised at this point? Um, when he came to the United States, he had, um, he had grown up in, um, in Berlin. Um, he referred to his childhood home as Schloss Boredom because he really hated his tutors um, and spent most of his time outdoors. Um, he then picks up French, he picks up English from his tutors at Göttingen, um, Christoph uh, Daniel Ebling and uh, Johann Blumenberg both spoke, both spoke fluent English and collected books on North America and were corresponding with Jedediah Morse, Samuel F. E. Morse's dad. They were members of the American Philosophical Society, so he knew English. He picked up Spanish while he was in the New World, 
And then it's kind of like Portuguese, Russian, Danish, it, it goes on from there. When he's in the United States, Albert Gallatin remarked to his wife that he spoke in a combination of French, English, Spanish, and German, sometimes all in the same sentence. <laughs> and at first I thought, well, you know, it's like anyone who's really enthusiastic, who's multilingual, and if you can't find the word in one language, you just by default switch to the other. But his traveling companions, one was from Ecuador and one was from Paris, neither of them spoke English. So I suspect there was a method to his madness to keep them looped into the conversation um, by using all four languages. Um, but when people visited him in, Ber in Berlin, and he became kind of a magnet for every American who came to Berlin, um, they all talked about the fact that he spoke English well with a German accent, but that he would often, when he got excited, start flipping languages right and left. When he writes to us, he writes to us in French, because he knows we don't do German. We write back in English. And I think it's because he feels he's expressing himself more clearly in French and in German, um, but he has no trouble understanding those things. When he lives in Paris, he writes all of his books in French. When he moves back to Berlin after he goes bankrupt and the Kaiser says, stipend, um, and so he has to go home because that's the way he's gonna pay the rent, um, then he starts writing his books in German. So the, the fluidity back and forth is very clear, but it's an excellent question because he is literally adapting to, it's like camouflage, he's adapting to his circumstances wherever he goes. I can't do that. Yes? When did the university be named after him? The university is named after both um, Wilhelm von Humboldt, his older brother, and Alexander. The interesting thing about Humboldt is, in this country when you say Humboldt, it's Alexander. In Europe, when you say Humboldt, they assume you mean Wilhelm because he was a fabulous uh, linguist, um, which is one of the reasons I think Alex knows as many languages as he does. Um, the university is named for them um, actually during their lifetime. Um, it, was, it was founded um, just simply as the, the university in Berlin, and it becomes uh, Humboldt University uh, while the two of them are alive. And in fact, if you go there now, Wilhelm's statue is on one side of the gates, Alexander's is on the other side um, as you approach Museum Island. <coughs> By the way, um, if you flip open an atlas and go to the index and run down Humboldt, every single feature named Humboldt around the world is named for Alexander. Um, because he was Simon Bolivar's best friend and Bolivar is the George Washington of the South American revolutions, every Latin American school child knows who Humboldt is. But in this case, John C. Fremont, um, who went running around naming everything after Humboldt um, in, in 1848, that's the reason we have the Humboldt Mountains, the Humboldt Basin, the Humboldt Range, Humboldt County, California. By extension, it's why you have Humboldt Fog Cheese, but the cheese wasn't, wasn't being made back then. And actually, when Nevada Territory uh, becomes a state, there's a contest to name it. There are four options. Humboldt lost by one vote. So instead of having Humboldt, Nevada, we could have had Nevada Humboldt, I suppose. But anyway, a, another small piece of trivia. But squids, <coughs> penguins, currants, all named for Humboldt. Yes? Uh, did he intersect with the Lewis and Clark in, intersect or the men afterwards at all? He did, he did not, but um, as you might expect, Humboldt inspired a lot of people, and there are a lot of German explorers who come over and hook up with the various expeditions who are all carrying letters of introduction from Humboldt, and they all meet William Clark in St. Louis because he is the gatekeeper. If you want a passport into Indian territory, which you needed back then, you had to go to William Clark in St. Louis. Unfortunately, Meriwether Lewis dies in 1809, um, before the Lewis and Clark journals are published. Um, whether or not he was um, murdered or committed suicide, it's really hard to tell. I'm actually a collateral descendant of his, and it's still one of those things that keeps people up late at night. Um, but Clark becomes uh, everybody's favorite redhead um, out in St. Louis. He becomes the head of essentially all of the Indian agents who are out there dealing with the Indian tribes up and down the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. So when George Catlin goes out west, he has to get permission from Clark to go up the Missouri River. When Prince Maximilian and Carl Bodmer go west, it's at Humboldt's behest. Um, Mulhausen, Duke Paul of Württemberg, the Duke of Saxe-Weimar, the Baron Eglostein, 
Um, they're all out there. The reason that there is so much um, German emigration into St. Louis and into Texas is in large part, a lot of them came over as explorers and 1848 political refugees who ended up being the political liberals who were inspired by Humboldt. When John C. Fremont runs for president on a Humboldtian abolitionist platform, Humboldt writes a letter endorsing him, Horace Greeley publishes it as part of the campaign literature, and Missouri goes 98% for Buchanan, St. Louis goes 98% for Fremont. Um, so your German-American communities in the 19th century were uh, inspired a great deal by Humboldt. There were a network of German-American newspapers. Um, it's really a, a, a fascinating aspect of American history that most of us just didn't get taught, which has been half the fun of this project. Yes? You, you touched on this a little bit. Mm -hmm. How widely known was the work of Church mm -hmm. during his lifetime? And then people who followed him, like Thomas Moran, were they well known in Europe? Uh, uh, so that when there was a painting in mm -hmm. Yellowstone, people said, you know, this is just fiction, or was it believable, or yeah. some Americans are just bragging? And oh, those are all such great questions. Uh, let me let me paraphrase them for everybody in the room. Um, how well known were people like Frederick Church and others um, in Europe and uh, elsewhere? And to what extent were some of these sort of fabulous landscapes of unusual places understood to be real, or were they given the high eyebrow as fiction? Um, Frederick Church had a very astute dealer, a Scotsman, um, who made sure that most of his major paintings toured at least the UK, if not um, mainland Europe. Part of the problem with Europe at this time is that if you're an aficionado of European political history, it's like there's always a revolution going on somewhere. And so the question is, when is it safe to be in Paris? When is it safe to be in Germany? When is it safe to be in Italy? Or you know, is Spain multiple kingdoms, or is it one thing? who actually owns Belgium and the Netherlands at any given moment. Um, and so it's a bit more turbulent at times, but most of Church's major paintings at least went to England. He had a very robust market there. Most Europeans still think and thought then that what we painted was interesting and kind of crude and much preferred the work of people like Claude Lorraine. Um, in England, it will be Turner and Constable. Um, we are we are not as well trained as they are, and so there is a value judgment that goes to that chip on the shoulder uh, that goes beyond subject matter. The good news for people like Bierstadt and Moran is by the time they come along and are painting places like Yellowstone and Yosemite, which defy the imagination, we have photography. And so at least it's like there's proof. And I do think one of the reasons that the vogue for Western art um, increases dramatically after the 1860s is because of Carlton Watkins in Yosemite and going up um, into Oregon and Washington State and then William Henry Jackson in Yellowstone with Thomas Moran um, and Hillers down in the Grand Canyon. So what happens is when that proof comes back, you know think about it, if you've grown up on the East Coast and most of the mountains you've seen are the greens or the whites um, or the Appalachians, you're looking at this going, yeah, right, tell me about it. Um, and it's understandable until you've actually seen it in some way that is not just the fish that got away. Um, it's a little hard to understand how these things really look or what the magnitude is. And so photography is really the game changer there. Um, if you're in St. Johnsbury tomorrow night, I'm actually giving a talk on their domes of Yosemite and how Yosemite became a national landmark. And it has to do with that intersection of photography and skepticism and realism um, as a way of understanding how do we make the West an American landscape when the Hudson River School has essentially already defined that for us um, in large part. So for artists like Moran and Beer Bierstadt would tour his paintings all over Europe. Um, he has patrons in the royal courts in Russia Germany, France, and England. He is playing with a very high-priced, high-rolling crowd. It will <coughs> force him to go bankrupt twice. Oh, wow. You can't throw parties at Delmonico's as a way of keeping up with the Joneses if you're not able to make book on your big landscape paintings. But he's willing to put himself out there in an effort to get those commissions. Um, Church is independently wealthy. He doesn't have to worry about all of that. 
but he still has a line outside the door for his paintings, at least until the vogue for Impressionism kind of kills the whole Hudson River School market in the 1870s. Um, Clarence Cook made a really nasty snide comment in 1900 when Frederick Church died when he said he didn't think he was still alive. Um, <laughs> Well, he'd retired to Alana for about the last 20 years, where he was very grouchy about Impressionism. It doesn't really make him look good, but you know, by that time, he's kind of like, you know, it's just crap. And it's like, well, some of it is, but not all of it. Um, but you know, how are you going to tell him that? Oh my goodness. Yes? Do you think a painting like uh, Icebergs has anything to do with Turner? Do I think that the icebergs has anything to do with Turner? In terms of the opalescence of the palette that's being used, yes. In terms of the construction or the subject matter, I hadn't ever really thought about that, to be perfectly honest, and now I'm going to have to think about it. Excellent. It, it's a great question. It's an absolutely great question. The interesting thing is that Turner, he's not nearly as popular here as Constable is. And so Ruskin makes a big deal out of Turner, and that would be the reason the church would be paying attention. I mean, Thomas Moran thought Turner hung the moon. Um, and that's from reading Ruskin. If you really want a triangle, it's, you know, Moran's polychrome palette with all those brilliant oranges and reds and blues and greens all in the same painting comes straight out of Turner. Um, but with church, it's a little harder to fathom because he doesn't give us any clues. Uh, Moran wrote down a great deal about where he was getting his inspiration. So, yes? I have a terrible memory. What was the name of the book you mentioned? At the start no of the problem, but... And another question was, uh, oh, I got to remember it. All right, well, we'll get back to that. It's called The Invention of Nature. Invention of Nature. And it's by Andrea Wolf. If you type in The Invention of Nature in your Google browser, trust me, it will pop up. <laughs> yes? Somewhat related to the earlier question, yeah. I'm wondering about how Humboldt's explorations and the subsequent art that flowed from mm -hmm. that might have related to the romantic notions that they had at the time about, of the sublime. Yes. Um, how does this relate to the sublime? Here's the interesting thing about the sublime. Um, Humboldt was deeply influenced by Goethe and by Immanuel Kant. Goethe was actually a good friend of his. They discuss rocks and minerals and maps. Um, it, it brings out the scientist in Goethe. It makes him very happy. Um, about Sir Edmund Burke, who postulated that the sublime was the kind of innate emotional response to being totally scared out of your wits. Um, it's like me on your bridge down there. Over, I don't do well on bridges, and I'm over this sort of foaming cataract, and I'm kind of going, I think I feel this whole thing swaying when it's not. That's the kind of thing. Humboldt believed that you could feel that depth of excitement and energy without being terrified. He thought you could do it. it, it did not ha fear did not have to be part of the calculus. And so he felt that you could have this expansive emotional relationship with nature and be totally in love with it rather than be totally wigged out by it. And that's where he and Burke kind of split the difference. In the United States, what happens is two things. Um, you know, I could keep you captive for hours and talk to you about how this relates to American transcendentalism and where Emerson and Thoreau come into all of this. Um, but it will be in the book that goes along with the exhibition, so I'll just leave that out there for you. But we see in, when, when Emerson and William Cullen Bryant actually talk about you know, nature's cathedrals, the idea of walking out into a forest and into the mountains and feeling at one with whether it's a deistic spirit or God, Humboldt was about everything except God. He was really about an animating spirit. He kind of danced around the whole sort of issue of organized religion, although he certainly knew a great deal about all of the world's organized religions, because why wouldn't he? Um, <laughs> But in this country, we seamlessly merge the two. We take science and we take spirit and we basically elide them in a way that is almost indistinguishable, whether or not you're having a spiritual <coughs> response to something or an intellectual eureka moment in front of it. It really is one and the same thing. And so landscape painting grows up in tandem with that notion of what I like, what Bill Bryson liked to call it, the therapeutic value of a walk in the woods. Um, that there is something about being in nature that uplifts the spirit, that cancels out some of the horrible things that happen to us, and that give us the strength 
to move forward. And I think Humboldt definitely felt that way. I think Church undoubtedly felt that way. And pretty much everybody who goes into landscape painting, um, some wag critic in the 1850s once accused them of basically playing hooky because um, they ate well, they slept under trees, they went where they wanted to, and occasionally they cranked out a good picture, whereas the portrait painters were all back inside painting people's faces. And it was kind of like the landscape painters had been let off the leash and figured out how to break all the rules. And I think that that's that kind of Humboldtian spirit where you're out there basically trying to learn it all for yourself. And so to me, it is all really a part and parcel of the same thing. And whether you're out there for the sublime, the beautiful, or the picturesque, I think in Humboldt's mind, it all just is gumbo. It, it's all together. How, why would you want to tease it all out when you can actually feel all three at once? Um, so I think he was a more is more kind of guy. <laughs> Everything to excess. One last question. Yes. Just about his uh, sense of capturing color. You mentioned yeah. with uh, regard to the bridge yeah. and the rocks. Yeah. Uh, do we have any of his pencil sketches? We do. I don't have slides of them, but if you go to either the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City, which is a branch of the Smithsonian, they have about 2,000 of Church's drawings and 525 oil sketches, and yes, I have looked at all of them. Um, Olana, his home on the Hudson, has a magnificent array of pencil sketches and oil sketches. There are books that have a good number of those. There was a lovely book years ago called Close Observation, which was about Church's oil sketches. And the, the oil and pencil sketches are just exhilarating. But yes, and in fact, with the, the one for Natural Bridge really does look like a schematic where he's got lines going in and he's got scribbled things on the side. And it's like Humboldt's nature map where it's half text and half image because what he wants to do is like get it all down. Um, and what I love about him is that he is the whole goal is to be able to come back and then make something wonderful out of it. And I think he really enjoyed everything about the process. And I think that's one of the things he shares with Humboldt, which is the journey is as important as the destination. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, all of you, for coming out.